Any final questions before we wrap up? My brother. How we doing then? We always take each other, so we'll talk later. Okay. Has any, because I was listening to what you were saying on YouTube, Jay-Z and Jay-Z and Jay-Z and Jay-Z and check yet. Has any entertainers ever contacted you? Any celebrities? I've been contacted by a couple of mid-level athletes. So not the stars, but the bench players. But you know, they still millionaires too, a lot of them. Yeah. So some of them told me that once I start my fundraising, they gonna come out. Also, met a couple people who work closely with some very popular athletes and uh, musicians. And they said that once the fundraising start, they gonna holler at them, see if they'll write a check. Now some of them won't be able to give me the check directly. They'll catch too much heat. You feel me? So if Oprah does decide to throw me a bone, she can't. You feel me? You have to give it to somebody. You got to give it to me, which is fine. Doctor Sabi, have you ever? Doctor Sabi? Yeah. No, I haven't had a chance to meet him yet. Um, I mean, we got. A, I mean, he's probably the best stuff, but we got a lot of good natural paths out there who I'm going to crack on to do some curriculum for. I might crack on him. You know what I mean? Um, and hopefully, he'll help me out. You know. But uh, I'll be honest with you, I ain't looking for too much help from the scholars, because most of them ain't about the people. They're about themselves and they're about making money. I work with most of them, I spoke with most of them, and most of them are worried about money. People y'all love and respect are pimps, most of them. The old ones and the young ones. And I ain't saying I'm the best thing out there, but it's few people who are as sincere as I am on the lecture circuit. The lecture circuit is another rap industry. Okay, Russell Simmons' mom will start signing conscious lecturers to Def Jam. Okay, they're not building nothing. Name me a scholar who's building something. Name me one. Everybody want to teach, 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 teach. Everybody building. Because teaching is easy. Building takes work, hard work, responsibility, labor. That's the problem with the conscious community. Ain't nobody doing nothing. All they want to do is teach something. So we got a whole bunch of very intelligent, powerless people. Claude Anderson, I like Claude Anderson. I haven't had a chance to uh, meet him yet. When I was in St. Louis last week, uh, one of the brothers said he's supposed to be bringing Claude Anderson to St. Louis. If I ever get a chance to sit down with him, I think uh, he and I can put our heads together, probably get something done. Okay. But again, I don't bank on conscious people. It's people out one way on TV, on YouTube, and another way in real life. Okay, that's why Dr. Umar wrote solo. A lot of people are about money, and I, I don't do what I do for money. You know what I mean? Talk to me, brother. Who? Brother Polite? I don't work with Brother Polite, but I respect his work. You know what I mean? I heard he working on some things. Maybe he is, maybe he not. But I have my own agenda, so you would have to ask him about what he doing. I don't follow nobody else but me and other Pan-Africans. Yes, sir? Where's the school at? You won't know that until the deal go through. That's the problem. For a lot of reasons. But if the deal go through, it's gonna be blasted out immediately because I got to start raising that money. So I'm just trying to keep it quiet for right now. So don't nobody sabotage it. I got enemies. How can anybody not like me? <laughs> anybody else? Talk to me, Will. What's that percentage of uh, middle class white women teachers in America? Oh, 93% of all teachers in America are middle class white females. They run it. And that's why I always say if you want to fix public education, the only thing you got to do is give every black boy a black male teacher. Look how easy that was. You cut special ed, cut fights, cut gangs, cut discipline, cut ADHD. All you got to do is give a black boy a black male teacher and you cut half the Yes! So why ain't they doing it? Because in order to hire black male teachers, you got to lay off a lot of white women. And America is for the privilege of whites, not for the benefit of blacks. And even though they know that if these boys have black men, this whole thing will be fixed, that's why they'll never do it. They are not going to lay off white women for the benefit of black boys. That's the reality. Yes, sir.
Now, <clears throat> a couple of questions about your curriculum. Um, as far as information technology, would you have any curriculum on, on that? Oh, no doubt. Or what kind? If no doubt. Specific on that. Well, number one, since I'm not a master of information technology, I'm relying on people to help me in those areas. Okay. But to give you the general, all of our children will graduate knowing how to build a website. They will all graduate knowing how to produce a documentary. Those two things they will be able to do. We're going to have a state-of-the-art recording studio on campus. Okay. So they will also be master music engineers too. So that's the goal. And then I turn it over to the team to create it. Now if you're interested in being a part of that team that builds that curriculum, send me your resume. Only people for whom I have resumes will be invited to the curriculum committee. You will, because that will not be a public thing. Okay. That will be inside only. The intent is to give people who might actually be working at the school an opportunity to have their hands on the final blueprint that the kids are going to be taught. Gotcha. Nothing worse than seeing a bunch of teachers take a curriculum that they had nothing to do with and have to implement it okay. when it doesn't even make sense to them. Gotcha. So I don't, I, don't, I don't want that. I want them to have a hand. Now, are you allowed to do any public fundraising for the school? Like crowdfunding? I will, once my lawyer get done the paperwork, but first we're trying to wait to see what the school said. Like crowdfunding sites? That's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, okay. It's the only way to do it. Ain't no other way I'm going right. to get that money that fast. Okay. I'm okay. going to crowdfund. Gotcha. So, and I ain't never asked the people for money before. Right. And I'm going to feel a little uncomfortable because, you know, I grew up seeing a lot of race pimps pimp the crowd, so I'm a little anxious, but I ain't got no choice. I got to raise the money. Gotcha. So, bullying people to write checks is going to be a new thing, but I think I can do it. My brother. Say, say again. Coming out in June. He better write a check, too. Because I help sell a lot of Hidden Colors DVDs. I know I'm getting a check from him, but we're going to have an issue. Next hand. My brother. How we doing? Doing all right. Um, one thing I want to say is that you know, I'm finally glad I get to finally meet you up close in person. Um, I'm a teacher myself right here in Palm Beach County. I teach at an alternative school. Okay. For children with behavior issues. And so, you know, one of my things is that I always want to try to come up with an alternative or try to find an alternative way to deal with, I guess, behavior issues in the classroom uh, before, you know, the referrals and that come, come aboard. So if you could, Okay, I give you two. Number one, read my chapter on emotional disturbance and on behavior. The quick version is if the children got emotional issues, you got to find out what the cause. It could be the way they're being treated at the school. A lot of the kids who are diagnosed with conduct disorder, the problem is the way that they're treated by the adults with no regard. That's what creates that anger. Is it coming from home? Maybe the father incarcerated and the mother don't teach them to go see their father. Maybe they are victims of sexual abuse, physical abuse. Maybe they're victims of bullying. Maybe they come from a home where their needs are not being met. Maybe they're homeless or don't eat. You know, black people, we have the largest population of homeless children. You know that? Homeless kids who still go to school, nobody know they're homeless. They go from front house to front house living. You know, so you got to find out the cause. You find the cause out, you eliminate that, you eliminate the behavior problem. Most of the time, it's as simple as asking the kid. You know, everybody want to do all this fancy stuff. You know what I do? I go in the room, tell me what's going on. Just be honest. What is the problem? Straight up tell them. And they straight up tell them, then we can solve it. But don't nobody talk to the kids, because the kids are irrelevant. You know what I mean? But most of the time, it's the institutional racism. You know, fatherlessness. Poor social skills, but it's, I've never met a kid I couldn't reach. And I used to be the school psychologist for the juvenile jail in Philadelphia. I was the school psychologist for the youth study center. I was the school psychologist for every discipline placement in the city of Philadelphia. I never met a child I couldn't get to. Sometimes it was tough, but ultimately, once they see that you care, you can get in. But see, the problem is, do you get enough time to build that rapport? See, a lot of time, you see, you don't have enough time allotted to build that rapport. Soon when you get somewhere, the bell ring. So it's like, damn, I keep starting to stop and I never get nowhere with these young men. You know, so that's part of the problem is the people who do care ain't given enough opportunity to impact the children. Now, when you was, uh, when you was doing it yourself, whatever, how, 
long of a time did you see a change in the students you had? It depends on the child. Sometimes it's instantaneously, sometimes it takes a couple weeks, sometimes it takes a couple months. Now, when you're talking about behavior planning, the question becomes, are the children tight-knit or are they a bunch of individuals? If the children are tight-knit, you can create a behavior plan for the whole class because they stick together. That's easy. But if the children are individuals and they play and hate on each other, then you got to have a whole bunch of individual plans, and that could be kind of crazy. You know what I mean? That's what you got, the whole play and hate thing where they don't stick Oh, man, that could be kind of tough. But you, what you got to try to do is build a relationship with each child, you know? It often comes down to how far you want to go. Have lunch with each child one day a week, or excuse me, one day per month. You know, teacher got 15 kids, well guess what? You will have lunch, each one of them get their own lunch date with you. You the first Monday of the month, you the second Tuesday of the month, you the third Wednesday of the month. Because one thing I've learned about children and behavior, they have a problem misbehaving when you got a close personal relationship. See, when they ain't got a relationship with the teacher, they're more likely to act up because they don't feel guilty. But once y'all sat down and broke bread, now it's like, I can't do this, you know what I mean? We didn't broke bread together, now they feel a little bit more guilty. So the key to cutting down a lot of that misbehavior is to build a close relationship. Take principles. The average principal does not have a personal relationship with any of their students except the star athletes. Right? So when a school is out of control, it's easy to understand because none of these kids know you on a personal level. So they don't have a problem playing with your fire extinguishers. They ain't got a problem busting your windows out. They don't know you. You a stranger in your own school. So you got to make it very, very personal. When I was assistant principal, I used to have sleepovers in the school, all types of programs. It was like a family. So the kids didn't want to disobey because they like, not only would I get on them, like, Dr. Umar, he looks out for us. You know what I mean? Ty, I can't. And a lot of us got their act in order out of the pure respect for who I was in the school and what they saw me trying to do for them. If they see love, they will show love. If they see neglect, they will produce neglect. The, children, the, the, the school culture, and I do a lot of work on school culture, the school culture is a mirror image of the adults who run it. The, I've never been in a school where the children are one way and the teachers aren't the same way towards the children. If the children are neglectful and nasty, it's because when I'm not around, the teachers are neglectful and nasty. The children only get exactly what they get. I've never seen it any other way. Which is interesting because you'll get principals and be like, I do everything for these kids. No, you don't. Impossible. The children are what you are. It's a mirror image. Yes. Now they turn against the whole world. For example, that's why I want my school to be residential. People say, well, why are you taking them kids away from their parents? I beg your pardon? Their parents ain't there. Parents is working two or three jobs. Parents, you see what I'm saying? I'm giving them a home away from home. They ain't got no home where they live a lot of them kids. Well, you want to have first graders and second graders. Ain't that too young? I beg your pardon? A lot of these parents raising these young kids are struggling. Chemical abuse, homelessness. Uh, 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 domestic violence, yeah, they home, but they don't want their kids growing up like that. They would rather give them to me and do it the right way until they get their act together. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of times when people make these little quick assumptions about the program, they fell into look at the kids who really need a family structure who ain't got one. Look at all these, uh, what they call them, uh, key lock kids who home from three to the time they go to sleep. They come home, they gotta do their homework, they gotta cook, and it ain't their parent fault, they out there working to keep the roof over their head. But they ain't got no family. We got a whole generation of black kids who are growing up without no clue of what a family is. So all I'm going to do is give them a surrogate family until they parents. I grew up in a residential school. I, I ain't seen that wrong. 
Okay? And I know the benefits that come from that. And so that's why I want to do the same thing. Anyone else? My brother. How, and I don't know if we can answer it right now on stage, but how much would it cost to bring you to a school to do? How much? Like, what would it cost to bring you to school? We can talk about that. But I'm the most reasonable person out there, and I'm the best, too. Anybody else? My brother. You might have answered this before. The school's going to be, the first school's going to be in Philadelphia? Well, if I get this college, it won't be in Philadelphia. Oh, okay, so you have another place to go. Yeah. If I get the college, the first school going to be at that college. And then for the kids who can't be there, I want to build a virtual school system where they can be at their computer and tap right into the classroom. Not cyber school, where they're being taught by a program. Virtual school, you're in the class with your classmates. They can see you and you can see them. I got a team out of Detroit We're going to build that virtual school. So like, if the child can't be there, he's still there. But even my virtual school kids are going to be required to come to the campus a couple times a year though. Because they, they got to build that rapport with everybody else. When they graduate, they can be a family. They are being groomed to look out for each other. Y'all will be with each other for the rest of your life. Like I was in my residential school. People I graduated with, we like brothers. One of them, I'm being his wedding this summer. I knew him since I was in eighth grade. That's 13, now I'm 39. You keep them friends forever, man. And so that's why I want to build, you know, build that camaraderie with them. Political ignorance. Black people have been so politically miseducated by the leaders, organizations, church, the black bourgeoisie, we actually think we can change the mindset of a people that has been permanently fixed against us for over a thousand years. That's insanity. How you want to change somebody who don't even want to be changed? Nobody voluntarily gives up power. Nobody does. Look at how they got it. It's made and they fail. They want to give that up. You're going to convince them to share some power? Who in world history has ever shared power? People take it. China ain't looking to share. They trying to get it. East Indian trying to get it. And you got black people trying to share. Talking about we colorblind. We the only colorblind people on the face of the earth. Nobody is colorblind. When the last time you seen a black person working at a Chinese store? Well, last time you seen a black person working at the Arab gas station? Never. Because nobody is colorblind but us. Everybody looks out for their own. And until we get that way, that stinginess that protects culture, we want to stay in their lives. We got to be just as selfish for our kids as everyone else is for their children. It's the only way to do it. And you're not wrong. That's the way it's supposed to be. But we've been so brainwashed by church into this whole thing about God don't know color. I'm not God. I'm a man. And I have to use my common sense to solve the problems that my people are faced with. And I really think the only way we're going to get out of that world, we got to change the thinking with the next generation. Black folks, adult black people, they are too in love with their oppressor to see outside the box. It's going to take us teaching those children to understand high politics and international relations so they can see it and understand that this is not hatred. This is not racism. This is called looking out for your family, your racial family, your global family before you look out for anybody else. Everybody else is natural. It's natural for the Arab to be partial to the Arab. It's natural for the Chinese to be partial to the It's natural for the Anglo-Saxon to be partial to the Anglo-Saxon. But with black people, it is not natural for us to look out for ourselves. Think about it. The minute you start talking about anything all black, black people get mad as hell. I was at the panel discussion last night, Indiana University. I said, race is more important than religion. One of the kids jumped up way in the back. No, it's not. How you want to say that? <laughs> but then I broke it down and we talked at the end and I had to get the brother to see, okay, that nobody puts religion above race but black people. You can have Chinese men, Italian, Arab, 
that Chinese people are Muslim. They're very diverse religiously. But if you ask him what he is, he would not say a Muslim. He would say, I'm Chinese. You go to the Italian, he might be Catholic, he might be Christian, he might be Jehovah's Witness, he might be Buddhist. The Italian, ask him. He's going to tell you, I'm Italian. Then we come to the Negro, the American Negro. What are you? He ain't going to say African. He ain't going to say African. American. I'm a Muslim or I'm a Christian. You see? So we identify totally with our beliefs instead of our being. How can what you believe be more important than what you are? That's the dilemma of African people. That's why Marcus Garvey said, practice race first, African family first, African people first. That's what I'm indoctrinating my kids with. They're going to overstand, understand, and understand race first. I'm going to have all kinds of religions at the school, but they got to be race first and not feel guilty. So last night, white man asked me in the crowd, white supremacist, Indiana white supremacist. He said, well, what about poor white races? Can they somehow work with the black folks? That's not that. Because the poor white man is still a white supremacist. I can't work with him. I said, me not wanting you in my group has nothing to do with me hating you because you're white. It's because you can never fully understand and embrace my struggle because you don't share it. And number two, your people, the collective will of your people would not allow you to stand side by side with me in a true struggle. Your internal leaning is to your own. You can never be more concerned with the struggle of the oppressed when you belong to the oppressive group. Because you are never gonna to wanna to give up your white supremacy card. There's not a white liberal in South Florida, I don't care how much they go to the black events, I don't care if you got a white, black wife, I don't care. There's no white person who's ever gonna to wanna to give up their white privilege card. Even, think about it, even when they come amongst us, they expect you to treat them special. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Every white person in the NAACP has a leadership position. Everyone. They do not accept subservient role because I am white. You see, and sometimes they can't even see their own arrogance as white people. See, my thing is for you to come into a black meeting and question why we don't want to be bothered with you, when I could never go to a Jewish meeting and say that. I, I, they wouldn't even let me in the front door. But you could, and we let this, and we do this. We let them feel comfortable coming into our meetings and railroading it into a discussion on why y'all not multicultural. Who the hell is multicultural? When the last time you seen multicultural in a Chinese restaurant? When the last time you seen multicultural in an East Indian store? Ain't nobody multicultural but black people. You're the only integrationist on the face of the earth. You want to integrate with everybody except other black people. That's the first thing black people do when they get some money, they move to the suburbs. We hate black people, but we love white people. Yeah. My brother. Jews found at the NAACP. No, he brought it. Yeah, I founded an NAACP college chapter in Lancaster, Pennsylvania when I was a grad student at Millersville University. And as a graduate advisor, I used to be privy to all the NAACP publications. And I would look at the board of directors. Half of the national board of directors of the NAACP were European Jews. That's why the NAACP has never done nothing for black folks, because it's controlled by other people. Which is why we got to go back to Garvey's, and we got to be self-reliant. We got to do it.
Nobody else can do it. Somebody asked me, what if a white person came up and said, we're going to give you $10 million so you can do your school and da 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 I said, I'm not going to take it. Are you stupid? What do you mean I'm going to take it? Because that's not a victory for us. If a white person gives me the money for the school, it's not a victory for us. It's a victory for them because here they go again solving our problems. We got to do this. If black people don't see it as important enough to back me on raising the money for the school, then we don't need it. And then I don't hear nothing else about no miseducation. I'm not answering no parent phone calls. I'm not returning no emails. I'm cutting all y'all off. Don't call me for your kids. I don't want to hear it. Because if it was that damn bad, we would have raised that money for the school. Don't call me. In fact, I'm, I'm done after that. I don't get the money. If this offer goes through, I am done. I'm disappearing. I'm going to move to Africa, become a monk or a sheik or some shit. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Queen. Conference. Yes. You potential? What was your background? All right. Yeah. Send me the resume. I gotta have a resume. And then what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go through the resumes, group them all up, see who's good with what. You know what I mean? You need to give me yours too, because when it comes to the whole survival, you feel me? Because remember, a lot of our curriculums ain't gonna be classroom curriculum. The survival. The, uh, what do we call that again? Information technology. Information technology, we need that. Sewing, I want the kids to learn how to sew, okay? All that farming, natural food, natural hair care. All of those we want to have curriculums for them. And most of them are not legally regulated, so you don't have to have a certification to teach natural hair care, you see? So we want to have everything under the sun. It's going to be a little university. Queen. Yes, but we're going to start with one first, master that, but ultimately we want a Pan-African school district. We want them everywhere. So, yes, we want them everywhere. And that doesn't just mean America. I'm a Pan-African, so I'm concerned about all African children. So we need them in London, we need them in Canada, we need them in Nigeria. I was in Suriname last month, I'll be in St. Thomas next week, Virgin Islands, we need them there. We need them everywhere. No, right now I'm focusing on the first. That's all I'm doing. I don't want to put the cart before the horse. Once I got that first one, and once I'm up and running, and now I have a replicable model, then that's when I come up with a time frame. I'll tell you something ironic. It's going to be easier to build the schools in second and third world nations than it will be the first world nation. When I was in Suriname, they said, you want to build a school? Pick your land out. Same thing, uh, St. Croix, pick your land out. So I'm like, damn, these are poor countries. They ready to build a school more than London and America and Canada. So it's interesting, I might get more of them done down there. You know, but the only reason why I want to do the first one in America, because I know a lot of parents are going to be uncomfortable having their kids living in another country. Because I thought about Suriname right next to Brazil, pretty stable, you know, right next to Venezuela, Brazil. Uh, but I know a lot of parents will be a free. Same thing with Africa. We say, you should put the first school in Africa. I would love to. But most black parents ain't going to send their kids to Africa because they think people, you know, eating people and stuff like that. So I got to do the first one here. You know what my biggest fear is? My biggest fear is when we go to uh, Ghana for this trip, that I'm going to get offered a government position in one of the African countries. I feel it. I feel within the next year or two, an African country is going to contact me and say, we want you to come here with official government status and build the educational system, rebuild it, or build the mental health system. I can feel it. And I don't want to be faced with that question. You know why? Because I'm not going to accept it because I got a loyalty to the kids here. I can't leave until I've done something here first. You know what I mean? Um, but they're going to ask me. I know they're going to ask me. It's coming, but I ain't gonna be able to do it till I get this school up. I, I, I just, I really can't see me leaving America yet as bad as I want to, because I don't see nobody else who's gonna pick up that slack. 
when it comes to this whole special ed and this education thing, who else is picking up the slack? If there was a couple more, then I would leave. I ain't gonna lie, I'm out. But I don't see nobody, so I got to hang around. It's my responsibility.